Hi, everybody. Thanks for coming. Uh, I'm uh, thrilled and excited to be here. This is the first time I ever uh, tell about this uh, in public rather than, uh, other than a few occasions on the trade shows. So uh, let's try to uh, find out how do we make a panorama just like the one we just showed, how to make it happen. So uh, today we're going to talk about HDR separately, then we're going to talk a little bit about panoramas, then we will talk about how to get these two things together in the hardware standpoint, just to take a series of images uh, that will later be uh, fused into a panorama. And that's where Jorgen will take over and uh, will tell you exactly what to do with those bunch of images you're going to have. So a little bit about me. Uh, I'm known as RT. Uh, those of you uh, who are familiar with the promote control, by the way, does it, anybody have a promote control in the room? Uh, ever, anybody? No? Has, have uh, anybody heard of it before? Yes. Okay. Good. Good. All right. So uh, if you, <clears throat> if you uh, were on the forums, uh, RD, the guy who, uh, who's answering the technical questions, is standing right here. I'm, I'm the lead engineer. I, uh, I do the, so well, I don't do the soldering anymore, but I still write the software for this. So if there is a firmware update coming, it's 99.9% uh, .9 of the chance that I've, uh, I've seen it. So uh, I love uh, the most the photography and the electronics. That's how this thing showed up. And a bunch of other stuff uh, when, uh, when I have time for it. So high dynamic range photography. Uh, thanks to Lauren, uh, about half of the audience, uh, as far as uh, I could tell, knows about high dynamic range. And let's uh, run a quick, um, quick show of um, high dynamic range for those that uh, didn't try this yet. So a lot of people are asking uh, if this is a fashionable trend or a real world technique that helps people. It used to be a fashionable trend of a few years ago when uh, there were not no serious uh, or very few serious uh, algorithms. Uh, workflows weren't uh, worked out really well and things were kind of hectic uh, for those who wanted to do HDRs. But uh, by now it's been around for years. People learned how to use it. People figured out uh, automated ways to uh, make high dynamic range pictures from a bunch of images. So you don't have to sit there manually uh, correcting every pixel and putting things together. It is a worked out technique. It's very useful for a certain, certain scenery. Uh, as you might have guessed, uh, it would be uh, very uh, useful for the uh, high contrast scenery. And the higher the contrast, the more it's useful. It's almost a linear proportion. And on it, if you're a commercial photographer, obviously it helps you sell more images. Either your uh, landscape or you're into real estate or into uh, things like uh, skylines for uh, cities, uh, all that stuff can, be, uh, can, be, can work really well in uh, HDR. Here's a, a good comparison of a low dynamic range on the left versus a high dynamic range of the same particular scenery uh, made out of 11 frames. Uh, this camera, you might have said, uh, the camera is kind of cheap and didn't capture the complete dynamic range. Well, that was a $5,000 uh, with a $1,500 lens. So Nikon D3 with a 2470 2.8. So it hardly gets much better than that for under 10,000 bucks. Still, we got uh, essentially a, a monochrome picture. The reason is, of course, uh, the contrast was way too high. Well, uh, we just took that little uh, box that I'm going to talk a little bit more about, hooked it up to the Nikon D3, Slapped out 11 images out of it, fused them together, and that's what we end up with. That's uh, pretty much what your eye sees over there. So the HDR is most useful uh, for the high contrast scenery. This is pretty much the shot of another uh, part of the same lake. It's uh, Hamilton Pool in Austin, Texas. Um, when I was doing the uh, single images, you know, uh, the uh, uh, ceiling was completely dark, the lost in shadows, and the sky was completely lost in highlights, so it was uh, entirely impossible to get this image without a high dynamic range. And HDR uh, of that extent could not be captured with any uh, camera that is currently present on the market, again, because 11 images spaced one EV each, that's what it takes. Another uh, useful application for high dynamic range photography these days is real estate. Take a look at this particular image created by one of our uh, happy customers, a gentleman named Michael James. Uh, shadows on the left, uh, on the bottom right side, um, uh, in, in those uh, chairs, would be much, much darker than uh, the highlights uh, outside of the window. And if you capture that in the, in the, into a single picture, it would, would not even nearly uh, present all the details that you can find in this particular shot. So in real estate, uh, 
using high dynamic range photography uh, done right, it can really speed up your workflow. It can uh, provide you with better images and ultimately bring you more clients just because they're going to love your work, just like this particular image. Well, uh, here's the basic technique for those who uh, have not seen this before. Uh, you take a whole bunch of images, in this case it's only nine, uh, ranging from dark to bright, sometimes uh, the other way around, it doesn't really matter. And then you merge them into a, a single high dynamic range image in a software of choice. There's plenty of software available for this. Uh, some people even prefer to do this in Photoshop. Uh, I prefer Photomatics Pro. They've been around for years. They have got the best algorithms. And I know the guys, they're really good. HDRFX Pro is uh, another uh, company that just came around. And they're pretty good, too. Multiple other software choices are available. Uh, Newer software choices are coming up about every other month or so, so uh, it's really easy to, uh, to find a, an option. Well, uh, why I want to talk about promote control. The, the problem is that the most uh, solutions today, the most cameras today, they cannot bracket past three or five frames. This is really nearly impossible to do a good HDR with. Uh, even if you step uh, or, uh, more than one EV step between the frames, let's say uh, uh, 5D Mark II could do, uh, I think, three EV steps uh, with three frames uh, in total. In a lot of situations, especially when there's bright uh, light source in the image, a lot, such as a sun or uh, uh, a light on the, on the dark street is going to create halos for you. It's going to be like those concentric rings of light that are really going to uh, ruin the picture for you. So the finer your exposure steps are, the better is, is it going to look. Well, unfortunately, you cannot uh, capture the uh, wide range if you uh, only do three frames with 0.3 or even 1 EV. So you're not going to fit into that magic 11 frames uh, that we just saw in Hamilton Pool. Well, uh, this, that's where uh, we had to come up with this little box here that connects to the camera over USB and entirely disregards what camera can do in, in terms of bracketing. It doesn't even use bracketing in camera. It basically just shifts your shutter speeds in camera per, uh, according to the program that you put in here. Compatible with Nikon and Canon and brackets up to 45 exposures in a row. Yeah, somebody actually asked us to do that. I don't know what they were photographing. Uh, I kind of forgot to ask for, for the results, but he said 31 was not enough, so we had 45. Up to 90 uh, steps between exposures that is way more than any camera can capture. So it can go straight from 1 8 thousandths to 30 seconds and even beyond that. You can get, yes, you can get uh, your HDR that far. And works for single images as well as panoramas. For single image, you basically take one bracket. For panorama, you take a bracket at every part of the panorama as you, as you turn it. And uh, we will talk a little bit about that uh, in uh, future slides. So why use promote control instead of the bracketing? Well, obviously, first of all, uh, it's much more powerful than bracketing. It's going to bring you a lot more uh, scenery into your, uh, in, into your workflow. It's completely automated. It always does repeatable work. Uh, if you move your camera uh, five feet away, 10 yards away, point a little bit different direction, you press the same button, pre-programmed, you're going to have the same bracket all the time, every time, with any camera. You unplug this from Canon 5D Mark III. It, uh, it plug it is, it's plugged to right now. You plug it in, uh, to the Canon Rebel, you're going to have the same bracket. Plug it into a Nikon, you're going to have the same bracket. Easy. And it can be mounted directly on the panoramic rig. If you're doing a panorama such as like this, put into this little uh, tripod holder or uh, put into the hot shoe with this new accessory we just came up with. And that creates a completely self-contained automatic panoramic rig solution. Press one button and this thing turns around like a robot. So for HDRs, uh, it's a pretty easy thing to do. What you do is uh, basically connect the USB cable. It comes with a remote control, of course, connected to the camera. Turn the camera on. Connect the shutter cable if you, uh, if you have it. That's an optional accessory uh, that uh, helps you do more things. And HDRs are done faster with it. And of course, b &H carries both of these things. Press power to fire it up. Choose high dynamic range mode. Put your camera in manual focus so that it doesn't interfere with our timing. Let's make sure it's in manual focus. Yep. Manual exposure so we can control the uh, exposure and shutter speeds. And just press start. That was a nine frame bracket on a 5D Mark III. You could never do this alone. Before you could uh, do this with a computer, yes. But uh, 
it's pocketable. You can put it into your pocket. It runs off two AA batteries. And uh, I have, uh, I think Sam told me once that in, in three years he changed batteries, what, twice? Yes, but he does shoot enough. Oh. <laughs> okay. So um, j just by a few button presses, you can reprogram this to take however many uh, shots you want with any camera that is supported out of the list. And it is, uh, it is every Nikon and Canon camera that is currently manufactured is supported, as well as uh, those that were done uh, about five years prior to this date. So, uh, what would you do? Pan uh, how would you do panorama in HDR? Basically the same way. Stop the camera at every panoramic location, take plenty of uh, images at that location uh, according to uh, how contrasty your scene is, and merge them into software. Uh, and uh, Jorgen is going to help us understand how to do that most efficiently and quickly. Obviously it's the best of both worlds. It captures a wide image area up to 360 degrees, just like that panoramic uh, image you have seen when you just came, uh, came into the room. Captures a wider tonal range, much closer to what a human eye sees, and it's completely up to you how are you how are you going you're going to uh, render this. It can be rendered any way from uh, completely uh, unreal to uh, to uh, more or less realistic, and that's uh, entirely software choice. And when done properly, it provides maximum realism. You can almost feel you're standing at that spot, especially with a 360. If you're turning your head around, it's it's quite interesting. So the hardware panoramic uh, HDR workflow is pretty, uh, pretty simple. You would connect the remote control the same way you do to your camera. And then make a little trick. Connect the panoramic head that normally is used to trigger the camera to the remote control instead. What that does is uh, the panoramic head is going to tell remote control to start a bracket at every spot. And let's see what happens after that. Uh, so the question is, uh, how did we come up with 11 uh, exposures uh, for the particular scene? It is, uh, it is not an easy question to answer. Normally you get this uh, just by uh, walking around and getting this by experience. The easy way to, to do is to overshoot rather than undershoot. Take more exposures per spot than you actually need and then choose the ones you actually need. Uh, but by reviewing, uh, viewing it on the camera, you can uh, take a test bracket, uh, not just uh, the whole panorama, but take a test bracket and use uh, the histogram to make sure that both your shadows in the uh, brightest exposure and your highlights in the darkest exposure are well, uh, well worked out. And use that as your bracket. It's pretty easy because Promote Control also shows you uh, the low and high end of any sequence. When you set up the, your, your uh, uh, high dynamic range bracketing in Promote Control, it tells you that the whole sequence is going to work from, let's well, say, 1 thousandths to 1 hundredth. And that's going to be the range. Uh, if you have a light meter, you can uh, meter separately for shadows, separately for highlights, and uh, punch this in directly. Uh, or just like I did, uh, take 9, 11 exposures as, you are, as your uh, rule of thumb, and pretty much it works pretty well for most situations. So if you, uh, so you, you asked uh, what panoramic hands do I recommend, if you have a large area of driving your rig around, uh, then a motorized head is, uh, is a very nice thing to have because it lets you repeat your panoramas uh, pretty much on every location. You can uh, drag this tripod uh, 100 yards away, put it up, press the same button, and it's going to do just exactly the same repeated thing. You don't have to reset it. You don't have to even control it manually. Now, uh, if you have to hike with it, then a uh, solution preferred by Jorgen uh, is, uh, is probably a better solution. Uh, you would do the same turns manually that uh, are done automatically here, but you could still use the remote control. Just click the Start button every time you turn it. Basically, the way that that looks is turn the head over to a position, click start, click through the expo uh, exposure bracket, turn it to the next location. It's just going to be uh, 20 times more clicks, but still, again, your brackets are going to be perfect. And do you recommend any particular brands? Um, we can talk about this a little bit later when oh, we I'm do sorry. more okay. about Yes, uh, Jorgen will recommend particular brands of uh, motorized uh, and non-motorized heads. Uh, he's especially into non-motorized heads. And after carrying this thing around, I can understand why. <laughs> so uh, that's the workflow demo that uh, we just went through. Uh, start a panel head. And the main thing is don't forget to get out of the way, because that thing is eventually going to turn right back at you. So chase it. Chase away. Run away. Um, remote control is uh, capable of doing more things than just that. 
high dynamic range is uh, what it started with, and uh, the idea came to me about 1 a.m. in the morning when I was shooting some uh, some abandoned construction and uh, ran out into a 30 second limitation on a, on the HDR. But since then, it's been about five years, and we've been asked to do uh, more things about it. One of the things is focus stacking. What that does, you basically take pictures of the same scene, but instead of bracketing your exposure, you're bracketing your focus. You're focusing on the front picture of the scene, then a little farther and farther and farther, and in the very back of the scene, you have plenty of images where different parts of the scene are in focus. And then you would use a, uh, some software technique. One of them is available in uh, Photoshop. And there are online examples provided from, I think starting from CS2 or CS3, even as far as that. And you merge them into the same, into one s single picture where the depth of focus can be literally hundreds of yards. It is just impossible to stop down a lens to get that depth of focus unless you're doing hyperfocal. In some cases, you just cannot do it. So you, you basically can have a depth of focus with, uh, only attainable with f22 while having all the light that you're grabbing at f2.8 or 1.4 for that matter. It's pretty easy. Uh, what promote control lets you do is it controls your camera focusing mechanism, doing exactly steps that you ask it to do in a very precise manner and taking pictures as the focusing progresses. So you end up with a bunch of pictures uh, pointed at the same scene. And that feature is available with, uh, with all Canon cameras that have a live view on it. So that, that's the limitation right now. Nikons are not compatible, and uh, Canons are only compatible if they have a live view. Uh, just yesterday, we have tested this with a 1D Mark III. It's been always working with a Canon 5D Mark II, 5D Mark III, 7D, uh, Rebels that have a uh, live view on it, 60D. All those, all those things can do focus stacking pretty well. And if you got Photoshop, 10 minutes later, you're going to have that focus stacked image ready. Another useful feature uh, is bulb ramping time lapse. Well, basic time lapse, uh, how many of you have ever done time lapse video? Okay. So uh, yeah, let me go into this a little bit. <clears throat> the idea is uh, you take a bunch of pictures of the same scene again, but you're taking them about every 10 seconds, and you progress uh, into a couple hours, maybe even a couple days. And since uh, then, you take all those images into a video, so the uh, pace of events is greatly spe sped up. Uh, that's, that's how uh, they uh, film those uh, things when clouds are passing real, real far, real, uh, real fast and uh, the day turns to night, and cars are passing by like spaceships and stuff like that. Well, that stuff has been known for years. Uh, that uh, is done with devices called intervalometers. They basically flip your camera every 10 seconds, like this, or every one second if you want to. Problem is this. What if you want to do this uh, over a sunset? On the day, you have to go uh, into uh, roughly 1 500th uh, of an exposure. In the night, you have to have four seconds. How are you going to jump between them? Well, a reasonable answer is to uh, just use your automatic exposure on the camera and let it do the job. Problem is, it's going to work in thirds of a stop at best. So uh, exposure is going to look like this. Drop, drop. It's going to be a really, really seriously flickering. Well, uh, cameras do not have a way of solving this by themselves. So we have to, we had to uh, come in and kind of hack it in. There was a technique invented uh, called bulb ramping. You flip your camera into the bulb mode where you can time any exposures you want. And then, pretty much, uh, ramp those exposures very, very, very slightly and smoothly from one to the other. So that, uh, when uh, joined to the video, they're going to look very smooth and very nice. There is uh, plenty of hardware uh, issues with that approach, uh, starting with the fact that cameras are not supposed to react quickly in bulb, bulb mode. They're just, they just can't. But uh, through a, a bunch of tricks that uh, we found from, uh, from other people and uh, came up with our lab, we came up with a device that can do a uh, time lapse from day into the night, completely unattended. And you can make a totally stunning video out of it. We have a few examples on the website. I think uh, those handouts um, have QR codes, and one of them uh, shows a few examples of those time lapse videos that we created as and our customers did. So it's pretty cool stuff. And uh, there's plenty of tutorials uh, floating around on this, uh, apparently. So. Uh, if you want to know more about it, shoot us an email. Uh, we're open. We're always listening to customer suggestions, and uh, we'll be we'll be glad to help you. So, uh, I uh, before I turn over to questions and comments, uh, I think we're going pretty fast with this. 
but uh, before I turn over to questions and comments, I want to also say that uh, we up update these box as often as new cameras uh, show up, or even faster, or even more often. Because uh, new uh, features come up, people want other things, people have uh, thought of other ways to do their job, and our job is to make their job easier, and yours. So if you uh, can come up with a way uh, that this box can help you do your job or make your pictures more beautiful, uh, let us know. We, we do continue developing it. Uh, it's been three years since it's been on the market, two and a half years since it showed up on the floor of B&H. And after thousands of these units have been out in the field, uh, I can only say that uh, I'm, happy to, I'm happy to be here. I'm happy to, uh, to be sitting at the keyboard uh, helping you guys doing your, doing your work and uh, having fun. So uh, how about some questions for, go ahead. So what I was going to ask earlier is two, two things. Mm -hmm. uh, this unit that you're using, how heavy is it? Uh, this? The whole, the whole rig, uh, honestly, I never tried this. Let's, let's see. So the question is how heavy it is. And uh, let me, I want to say roughly 15 pounds. 15, with the camera on it, yes. It's a 5D Mark III uh, with some uh, pretty, pretty easy lens. Yes. And that's the key to capturing correct uh, uh, a series of frames as you're trying to, to create uh, images for a panorama, correct? Yes. Uh, just like you said, the, correct, uh, the only correct way of capturing HDR images is not move the camera while uh, it's going through the whole uh, set of HDRs on a particular scene. If you do move it, then the images are not going to overlap well. And uh, there's going to be a, a dual vision sort of thing. Uh, why that is uh, always happening without a remote control is because your camera cannot do three, more than three brackets on its own, so you have to flip uh, switches, play with uh, wheels and everything, and it inevitably shoots the camera off the path. With this, of course, uh, it's all uh, done through the, same, through the same line. You're standing uh, two feet away and basically enjoying the view. You know, this is what's confusing is that the camera actually does move, though, but it's not changing planes is the, is the key difference. Uh, it does. It does move between panoramic stops, yes, but it moves with overlaps. So that uh, the, the key about HDR is uh, that while it's shooting one part, one part of the panorama, it's not moving uh, during that time. That's why that particular portion is, gonna, is going to, to uh, fuse ideally. And when you're uh, later uh, doing the uh, panoramic fusing, uh, those things are overlapping by about 30%. That's the default setting, or however, however you set it, then Jorgen is going to comment on that as well. And uh, those things have uh, enough overlap to be, uh, uh, to be uh, stitching successfully in panoramic workflow. Excuse me. Go ahead. So the pictures, are over, the, pictures the, the edge of the frame mm -hmm. is overlapping, and the pictures are, are uh, superimposing on one another. I mean, you're, you're shooting from the same. So you have an overlap from the side of the frame as well. Mm -hmm. And then you have you have a superimposition of each picture, each exposure on top of the other. Correct, exposure. correct. Uh, yes. Uh, the question was uh, whether we have uh, we have a superimposition of pictures uh, both on their edges for panorama, and uh, on si on every particular spot, a uh, number of images are superimposed for the HDR. And the answer is yes, that is true. So uh, let's imagine that for uh, panorama, you are supposed to take uh, let's say 20 pictures. If you take a uh, nine image uh, HDR panorama of that, you'll, you're going to have nine images times 20. So you're going to have 180. And uh, there are automated ways of pro processing uh, those bunch of images, because I'm sure no, no, no one of you wants to uh, fuddle with 180 pics. So you just press a couple buttons, and uh, uh, Jorgen, uh, Jorgen will uh, talk to us about uh, software choices for this uh, as well. Go ahead. Yes. Middle and down. Yes. Is that how they are stacking the focus, or is it getting the panorama? It's getting the panorama. OK, now this is mounted uh, horizontally. Yes. Horizontal. OK, uh, the question was uh, when uh, the camera is going up, and then middle, and then down, whether it's focus stacking or a panorama. The answer is it is a panorama. Uh, because to capture a full panorama, full 360 degrees, uh, up, down, left, right, and all the directions, you have, uh, with most lens, with this uh, lens that is not wide angle, 
you have to cover multiple rows. You have to sort of scan the picture. Now, again, uh, there are easier and faster ways to do this. You trade uh, a little bit of resolution, but if you set up a super wide angle lens uh, just like Jorgen does, you can say have the full 360 panorama in what, four pictures? Four pictures, exactly, instead of 20. Uh, our box costs $329. That's for HDR focus stacking and bulb ramping. Uh, panoramic heads, oh, that's that's much wider choice. Uh, you can start with, what, $200? starts around $200 and goes up to 10000 for a motorized big one. Yes, uh, this particular head is 995 uh, It's uh, It's probably one of the most known for for the price and for, for the support, but uh, there is plenty of different options. So this set up how much without the camera? Without the camera, this set setup is roughly, uh, uh, without tripod, yeah. it's uh, $1,400. It's available I'm sorry? And a vertical image, uh, you'd have to purchase an L bracket for your camera if you want to do that. So the question was basically, can we do HDR and video? And the problem is, there's only one, uh, two uh, projects currently out there. One is called uh, Magic Lantern on Canon cameras. They did some trickery where they film at 60 frames per second and forced the firmware to take two different exposures every 30 of a second. So they are able to do some fake HDR process. There are other ideas to take two DSLRs and combine them with a mirror and film basically two images at the same time through a semi-transparent mirror. That's the other technique. The third technique is to use a very good sensor that has an extremely high dynamic range and just capture the full range. So those are the three techniques that are currently out there that are working. None of them are very cross. <laughs> <laughs> I hope right. that answers your question. Uh, go ahead, please. I, I have two questions based on the pro item. Yep. The focus stack, does that eliminate the, the need for a rail? Uh, a yes and no. Uh, the question is whether the mm -hmm. focus stacking mm -hmm. mode in the promote control eliminates yeah, the need for a rail. <clears throat> the uh, answer is yes and no. Some people uh, prefer rails because they do not shift your plane of focus. And it, with, when you're focused extremely close, like with macro lenses, Changing your uh, focal plane actually change your, changes your field of view. So, so, the images, so the images might not stack correctly if you're in extremely close proximity, and I'm talking uh, super macro range. Uh, I've heard that feedback, yes. Uh, I have not tried this myself, but uh, for, other, uh, for other situations, such as if you want to do uh, scenery focus stacking, you would definitely be much better off with this mode because uh, rails are are not going to do this for you because changing uh, focal distance this much, if you have to shift it uh, from here to 200 meters away, is probably not going to help. So for, for, for not macro, other than macro. Other than macro, yes, this is definitely a preferable approach. And then for in doing the HDR, I'm sorry, not the HDR, the time lapse. Yep. <laughs> using this for a longer time lapse, is this doing anything to affect the heat in the sensor at all? Or uh, the question is whether the long time lapse affects the heat on the sensor and creates any heat related issues to the sensors. The answer is no, uh, because uh, with time lapse you're not taking, uh, mostly, you're not taking too long exposures, you're taking plenty of exposures. But be between those exposures, shutter is closed, unless you're doing this in live view and you probably shouldn't be. Uh, <clears throat> just disable live view and in this case if the shutter is going to open, take an image quickly and then close back down. And uh, during uh, that time, uh, camera sensor is not active. It's not going to heat up, and it's not going to have any additional, uh, additional noise. Do you, have, do you have instructions on this kind of stuff in your pamphlet for the uh, we, uh, we supply uh, an instruction manual with a promote control uh, that is 100% uh, uh, covering uh, the version 2.0 of the firmware that comes with the unit as, when you buy it. Uh, there is a 2.53 firmware on the website that has plenty of new features to it, and there is an online manual that you can either look online or download in PDF format. Go ahead. Can you use the inverse in your focus shifting? You said increase your depth of field mm -hmm. if you want an extremely shallow depth of field where you have one, like your face mm -hmm. in focus and everything else blurred out. Can you do that? They, uh, so the question is whether we can uh, do the reverse focus stacking, uh, which means uh, instead of very large depth of focus, have a very shallow depth of focus. The answer is, 
uh, not with this technique. For this, uh, you could only uh, this you could only do with a super fast lens. Uh, 85 1.2 from Canon comes to mind. Uh, taking a shallow depth of field requires a very wide aperture, and that's an optical thing that uh, you basically cannot go around, unless you, of course, want to go for software tricks and use some blur. But go ahead. So the question is, uh, how uh, do we release our firm firmware upgrades, and uh, what does it look like? We release them as uh, as a little file that you download off our website. Firmware. It's a firmware upgrade. It works on the same hardware platform. It immediately makes it compatible with new cameras, and uh, you use a computer program available for Mac or Windows separately to uh, upload firmware into the box while it's connected to a computer. The whole process takes under under a minute, and you can d up and downgrade to and from any version as, as you please. Sorry, please. I'm just really interested. Go ahead. Uh, the thing is, if um, I'm particularly interested in real estate photography, because okay. much of it's done really, really poorly. Mm -hmm. And um, the thing is, some of the, the real estate photographers I've spoken to so far, they had a supplemental strobe light or, 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 or bounce flash or something okay. to you know, to sort of ease the transition and okay. bring up more detail. How will that, uh, how will your unit accommodate that, accommodate the fact that there's a flash into the equation? The only uh, limitation to having inflation to the equation is, uh, well, I can actually think of two things. First, uh, the more parameters you fix when using a flash, uh, by fixing I mean uh, make, uh, make it manual exposure and manual flash, the better, because when remote control tries to play uh, with uh, shutter speed on the camera, uh, if camera thinks it needs more flash, that may ruin your total exposure. So it, it would make co total sense to move your flash into the manual mode. The other consideration uh, is things, just, keep, just keep on, on firing the flash at the same mode. But you know, if you have, if, if that's your ambient light source and mm -hmm. you're building against that, at some point, wouldn't it overexpose? Uh, it might. In that case, it, in that case, you might experiment with uh, automatic flash mode as well. People uh, people do this as well and pretty successfully. Uh, the only other consideration is flash is going to take some time to recharge. So you're going you're to have to have longer delays between the shots for the flash to uh, successfully uh, recharge to the complete level. And promote control has menu settings where you can uh, artificially slow it down. So it, it lets your flash uh, get, up, get back up so to 100%. Recycle. Correct. Okay, thank you. Any more questions? Oh, looks like uh, looks like all questions have been answered so far. So uh, I suppose I will turn the floor over to Jorgen Geertz for a uh, presentation on the software and more on the hardware part of the panoramas. So as Artie already mentioned, I'm a New York-based photographer. I specialize in panoramics and uh, do commercial and architecture. And this is a scene I shot a couple of years ago in a, a New York ad agency. So I'm, I'm playing basically with the theme that how we do we do architectural photography and combine it with panoramic views. And so besides being a commercial photographer, I also invented a new camera system that does full spherical uh, 360 video. And that's the first one I presented this about two weeks ago here in this spot for the IVRPR conference. And I'm also a member of the IVRPA. And if you're interested later, we can talk about this also if you want to become a member. Um, I run a couple of websites. The most prominent one is newyorkpanorama.com. Um, I'm also an artist. I exhibit in Chelsea. Um, mostly known for my large-scale night panoramas. And they all like start at eight feet and go up from there. So I like, I like large prints. Uh, this was a shot from an exhibit in Portugal I did. Uh, this was a, I think, 15 meter print that we exhibited there in three pieces. And this is also the currently largest panorama shot of the Brooklyn Bridge in the world, I think. I'm still holding that thing. Of course, this is shot in HDR, bracketed with the promote heavily. And I, I walk around in New York and shoot all the, 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 the interesting spots and also the difficult spots. So this shot would be absolutely impossible without heavy bracketing that is involved. 
because the Pepsi Cola sign is so incredibly bright and yeah. the rest of the city is pretty dark compared to the Pepsi, if you've seen it before. Um, many years ago, we were faced with the problem that Arti already has, uh, has the same uh, thing, is Canon did only two plus minus, plus minus two EVs. Um, and this wasn't enough for my night shots. Uh, I want to do longer than 30 seconds. I want to do 60 seconds, 120 second exposures for my panoramas. So I actually did a very crude precursor to the Promote. Um, that's the so-called Bracketmeister. It was Arduino based and did also custom brackets in bulb mode. Had no USB protocol attached to it. It was literally just triggering the B mode and it worked fine until uh, RT graciously came out with this product and I bought it right away. I'm, I'm user number 25 and I'm very happy since then to have the promote. And it's still working. It's an amazing little gadget. So this was a shot I, I shot about uh, two weeks ago. And um, this is the same ad agency has changed it a little bit. So it's not fully processed yet. So there's a little bit spots in there that need to be touched up before final delivery. But it's uh, showing also the need of where do we need to have HDR because um, the different parts in the image are very bright. We have the windows that we're facing and we're facing the um, uh, outside and the inside of the agency. So to show you the real world example, I brought actually the raw files from that shoot so we actually see what, about what we're actually talking about. So we have five exposures bracketed by 1.7 EVs apart. Um, what use lens hmm? what lens? This was the uh, Tokina 10 to 17. This was shot at 15. So for panorama, you need six rounds, one up, one down in this resolution. Okay, so the, the standard panoramas in this one was shot at, uh, with a Tokina 10 to 17 at 15 millimeters. So you need six around, one up, one down. Um, I occasionally also shoot at uh, 12 millimeters where you just need four around and then maybe one down if you feel inclined to. Um, in terms of figuring out the exact exposure that you need between them, I prefer to actually take a shot and measure it and look up on the histogram. How much of the windows do I capture in the short exposure and how far down do I need to go with the shadows to actually have stuff like, uh, for example, here on the shelf, I knew that this would be something that's a little bit the darker spot. So I definitely want to bring the shelves and the dark spot up in the 50% area because I know that's sort of a range that I need to get in there. Um, and same thing basically going to happen then all around. Let's open the next set for you. So this one is basically just another direction of the same shot. And here you see basically what we talk about uh, also the additionally that we need a flash in very in certain areas which was basically the kitchen area that was straight back here it was an incredible dark spot and I knew that in the final panorama this would be a little dark hole so I didn't want to have that so I had actually a big flash unit positioned with a, re with a remote trigger far around the corner so it would be just lighting up that little spot back there and I changed the, pan the, the pro mode basically to allow the flash to recycle, but I had it to basically set to 75%, so the flash kind of had a very long recycle time, so it uh, didn't trigger all the time, but I knew with the technique I was using, it didn't matter so much. That I basically just needed one good exposure in there and I would be fine. Um, from work uh, workflow here, then we basically export the shots into um, uh, TIFFs in 16-bit. Mm -hmm. 
And I'm a big uh, fan of uh, using a technique called exposure fusion. Exposure, there are two techniques for HDR. One technique is using the bracket, developing them to a TIFF or using the ROS directly and combining all the exposure values from each exposure into a so-called HDR file, which is a floating format and that really captures the absolute brightness of each pixel and the color value. So you have very ray dark range. The data that's in an uh, HDR file cannot be displayed. It's our screens, they render 8-bit and have a certain dynamic range, they cannot show. So we always have to back backtrack the HDR files into what is displayable on our screens. And that is so, uh, uh, called, so a technique called uh, tone mapping, where you take those huge ranges of floating values and kind of compress them on a certain mathematical way to make them displayable. Um, a big uh, fan, um, big group of this is on Flickr, where we see the HDR tone mapping, and the software can give you very wide range of creative choices. And unfortunately, many of them look like a little bit like clown vomit at the end. So I'm not a big fan of it. And the other technique is exposure fusion, where the algorithm doesn't combine all the exposure values from each bracket into one file, but sort of picks the well-exposed pixels of each exposure and combines them into a final image. So we're not going into a 32-bit a floating format, we stay in 16-bit and um, then combine it. Uh, Photomatics has the option to do that. Um, I prefer a little tool called Enfuse GUI, uh, which is freeware. Igmar Bergmark uh, wrote it a while ago and it's based basically on a program called Enfuse. A uh, very simple thing, we take our five brackets that are coming from it, drag them in here, has a nice little interface, go to preview, and it shows you basically what it did. So here, now we can see basically, sorry that the window is a little bit small, basically how it combined all those different exposures into one exposure that doesn't really have any um, controls over it. Now we can go back. I literally use the default settings for most of the time because it's kind of nice. But you can play with uh, mostly the uh, mu and the sigma settings. The three other rulers are exposure, contrast, and saturation. Um, you can use the contrast uh, thing to do focus stacking, for example, because the difference between in, a, in, a, in a focus stacking scenario is that you have pixels that have a high contrast. Those are basically indicate this is a sharp pixel or a sharp region. And there are regions that have a soft contrast. So this is sort of out of focus. So with this technique, you can tell the, focus, the program basically, pick only the pixels that have a high contrast next to each other. And the software, they kind of think, OK, this is probably the region that's in focus. And you can use this, basically, to do your focus stacking. Uh, other focus stacking software does a little bit other techniques, but uh, this is just one of the side effects that you can use. Um, I usually just use the exposure value, basically pick the pixels that have a good exposure range. Um, you can also use the saturation, sort of, because uh, underexposed or the badly exposed pictures have bad saturation values, usually. So on this way, you can basically tell the software, basically take, pick only the ones that have a good saturation that uh, indicates also good. So let's just infuse it. Runs a little bit. Um, this software is already set up for, for panoramic view. So it can batch hundreds of images that are done, and it just runs through them and it spits out the TIFF at the end. So let's see what it did here. May I ask you a question even though it's in over here? 
Um, okay, what? So this is a free software. Yes. And you are using it both for HDR and to stitch your panels together. Is that right? No, this is uh, this software is not a panorama stitcher. Okay. This is only to pre-process my material okay. for the panorama later. Okay. So here we have it. Is it not a good idea to fix lens distortion before you before you do this process? So the question is, do we fix lens correction before or after? Um, I stitch my material in PT GUI or actually any other good panorama stitcher, and they have excellent lens correction algorithms built in because that's the process of making a panorama. So pre-rendering or pre-fixing this distortion of any lens, especially a fisheye lens like this, you would distort the pixels twice or more than once. So you want to basically just don't disturb the pixels too many times because they get wrangled around pretty badly in the process of making a panorama. But then but severe distortion comes out really well. Uh, yes, this is com completely. With this software. With PT GUI or any other panorama software, it goes goes away. If you have a single shot, then yes, I would definitely do remove the distortion in Adobe Camera Raw straight away. Because the closer you do it to the source, the better you off you are. And now we're basically facing also the, the problem of HDR uh, that we see ghosting. Basically, because the people, of course, move. People never stay still. They never want to. <laughs> so basically, this is now, now we turn into a two-step process. How do we do the de-ghosting de process in here? Uh, automatically, and Fuse GUI doesn't do any de-ghosting by itself. And so let's try uh, Photomatix, for example. Photomatix has the same. Um, so we're going to run it in trial then. So let's use the same TIFFs we just did in Enfuse GUI. We don't need to align the source images for this one because they were shot from it, but we want to do the remove ghosts. So now we basically uh, have to select where are the ghosts. The ghosts are two ladies here on the side, at least those we're <coughs> going to focus on. We need to say the soft, tell the software basically, okay, those here we suspecting ghosting. So let's see what it does. And let's zoom in a little bit. Or not. OK, so it doesn't let me zoom. OK. Sorry about the weight. <laughs> so now we have basically our in the uh, PT we uh, in the infuse GUI and uh, no sorry in the photomatics interface. Photomatix tries to do HDR first because that's what it's very well known for for the last years, but it also has this little exposure fusion mode. It does sort of similar things as the Infuse GUI we saw earlier, just has a couple more sliders that we have. And now basically those two ladies here are uh, deghosted. So you can see no more moving and uh, <coughs> The software picked basically one exposure from the center to prevent any doubles from there. If you want to do the same in Enfuse GUI, 
you need to do some fakery. And what I usually do is I pick the exposure in Camera Raw that I want and create fake exposures from it by literally going into the ACR mode and exporting the good exposure. This is probably here the middle one. And just adding here the exposure, say the next step, I knew that I bracketed with 1.7. So I type in 1.66. And then save that as a TIFF, name it properly, do another one with plus 3.3 and another one with minus, and so on, and so on. And then I combine those, basically. And then in Photoshop, I layer those two on top of each other and mask them out. So those are two techniques that um, are silently used, basically, in the panorama uh, world from many commercial photographers. Uh, the infusion process gives a very natural process to it because you don't have to deal with halos with high contrast areas and HDRs that are coming. You still get a very natural overall contrast to the image. So the blacks are still black, uh, medium areas are still medium, and the highlights are still somewhat natural. And it's basically up to you how far out you want to push highlights in Windows, for example, by adding just another exposure on the promote to it. So this was some, some simple steps what we can do with this technique. Cool. I hope that answers some of your panoramic questions. I hope it was uh, interesting for you guys. And I hope you go out and shoot interesting stuff. Thank you. Thank you. For more information, please visit us online, give us a call, or stop by our New York City Superstore. You can also connect with us on the web.